Uh, we have the uh, pleasure and honor uh, today to have a colloquium by Dr. Chloe Kim. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Uh, he, I would like to just mention that uh, we're going to have approximately one hour talk with half an hour of Q&A and, and we do have some refreshments uh, available at the back. I also wanted to mention that as I think some of you recognize a lot of faces, as you know this is part of our colloquium series. Uh, that will continue next week with another talk, so I hope that those of you who uh, are here for the first time uh, will be back. We have a series of open talks, uh, including on the topic of Africa. We just came back from Durban, and obviously the topic of Africa and South-South Cooperation in Africa uh, is particularly important right now, not just for China, but also for Brazil. So it's been a pleasure to have Dr. He here working with us on comparative research also, uh, because it's so important for us to understand how the differences and similarities in the Brazilian and Chinese approaches uh, to Africa. Let me just uh, give you a brief sense of Dr. He's bio, uh, which I think doesn't really do justice, but it's a start. Uh, Professor Ho Wen Kiang is a research senior fellow in African studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. Her area of research covers Africa's relations with China, and major Western powers, as well as African democratic transition, um, the role of emerging powers and their international performance, including the BRICS. She has published uh, several books and articles widely on the above topics, and in particular on international aid to Africa, also comparing a policy and effectiveness between developed and developing um, emerging powers, which is also part of our research agenda. Uh, this includes emerging power partners and their impact on African development, China's aid to Africa, policy evolution, characteristics, and its role. And I'd just like to add that Dr. Ka is also one of those people who can successfully uh, bridge uh, academic and policy worlds. Uh, for instance, she just published a very interesting editorial in China Daily, I think yesterday. Uh, so, it's, it's a pleasure to have Dr. He, uh, especially someone who can transit among so many different policy and academic circles. We'll have, as I said, about an hour and then uh, a Q&A session. So, thank you for uh, uh, coming here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Diana, for your uh, nice introduction. Actually, until now, so China-Africa, the past, the present, where is those uh, modern things? All right, here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, because this is a long journey from the past up to now, so I'm trying to divide it into those four uh, points. So the first, what kind of historical heritage we have inherited from those past, uh, maybe, you know, if you can count it to the dynasties and up to now. So, uh, by the way, during the past 10 days uh, of my stay here, I have read uh, quite a lot of stuff about uh, Brazil, African policy. So I'm intending to write something to compare those two. So very interesting, you also got long history with Africa. So heritage uh, from the history and also those development periods of uh, China, Africa. And uh, how is the current situation between China, Africa? And the third one is the forecast. That's the uh, abbreviation, a short name of the Forum of China African Cooperation, and what kind of impact this forum has been generated so far. And then, final one will be the opportunity, trends, and the challenges lying ahead. So, go first, uh, because I often overuse time when I give uh, some speech, so I have to keep uh, looking at my watch. So, China African relation, uh, historical heritage. So long history, I think we can trace it uh, almost back to uh, Han Dynasty, that's the 2 BC. So you see, and then we have uh, lots of dynasties during our, uh, you know, uh, it's called, uh, uh, I think it's 5,000 years of history. And then uh, we have travelers back and forth. Chinese travelers also has been to uh, North and East Africa, and then we also invited uh, also have, uh, uh, have uh, a traveler from the Morocco. His name is called uh, Ibn Batuta. I used to uh, visit Morocco twice, and then the embassy of Morocco in Beijing, very happy to see a, public, uh, a book uh, written by one of my colleagues. This is called Morocco, it's a book. Now we, there's one of the research, now my institute is doing. We are trying to publish 
uh, all those uh, countries profile, each country have an independent book covering everything from history uh, to the current issue, foreign affairs, uh, and also economic and uh, everything. And then, of course, that's in, in Chinese so far. So that's a serious uh, research work. So why I sent this book, and also another book is uh, Ethan Patuta's travel diary in China. So, uh, the ambassador of the Morocco is so happy uh, to, to have that book. So, and then uh, I have to, to mention this great navigator called uh, uh, Zheng He, and uh, he is the navigator in Ming Dynasty. So he had traveled, uh, uh, led a fleet. At that time, the fleet, I think, uh, of those ships, that was the most advanced one in the whole of the world. So uh, visit more than 30 countries in Southeast Asia and the countries along the Indian Ocean for seven times, so since 1405. So uh, nowadays, we have sent a lot of scientifics to, uh, to Lamo Island. That's the uh, coast, uh, light island, coast of, off coast of this Kenya to see those evidence uh, during a uh, gentle uh, trip. So Kenya and Tanzania, he has been there four times uh, in the year 1405. So now all those trips, I think that's the feature, a peaceful and goodwill. So there's no slave taken and uh, 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 no land occupied at all. So the only thing the navigator Zheng has brought back to, uh, to China, I think is those uh, Giraffe, probably uh, some uh, beautiful souvenir uh, from Africa. I collected a very handsome and good, good looking picture. Uh, that is the, because there's no camera at that time, so this is a picture drawn from the historical book. So this is Zheng He. Uh, actually, his uh, given name is H E, is her, different from my name. So normally Chinese name put uh, at the final part, that's the given name. And then the given name, uh, so that's his family name is Chen. And that goes to the, after this historical uh, relations during the Ming Dynasty, unfortunately I haven't seen uh, much contact afterwards, all the way until uh, the People's Republic of China had been established. So that part of history, I don't see the Asian and Africa, China had more contact. So after the 14, 1949, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, established, and then this link has been reconnected again. So after that, up to now, still more than half century has been passed. So according to my uh, writing, there are different sayings coming from different Chinese scholars. So my uh, writing is I divided into those more than half long history into three periods according to their different characteristics and different driving forces. So the first one uh, I think should be uh, marked from the 1950 all the way to the end of 1970s. So you should know at that time, uh, the new China was facing the diplomatic isolation by himself, and several wars had been going on. Korea Peninsula, there was a war there. Nowadays, Korea Peninsula, the tension has been built on again. So uh, that's not surprising for me to hear our new president say, okay, the, the, the patience is not, couldn't be always there. So he sent a strong message, not only to DPRK guys, uh, I, I think he's sending to all of those relevant play, uh, play holders. Korea, South Korea and Japan and of course United States. So and also in the in the South China, New China is also facing war. So this diplomatic isolation has been there. So there's no other places to go. The only places to find friends to uh, establish our own uh, allies in the world is to Africa, to those newly independent uh, African countries. And Mao has a very famous uh, theory for guiding our uh, diplomacy that is called Three Worlds Divided Theory. So according to his idea, Soviet Union and the United States, of course, that's the first world. And then those newly developed, uh, newly independent the country, the poor country, they are third world. And it's like uh, European country and Japan, those countries are between the second world. 
So a mouse theory is very clear. Only those uh, third world countries is are uh, those countries we can rely on. So that's also why our institute was established in the year 1960, 1961 or 1963, 1961. So like Latin America Research Institute and African Research Institute has been established a long, 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 long ago comparing our American Study Institute. American Study Institute was established only uh, in the late 1980s. So we have a uh, uh, that's Mao's uh, idea and his uh, order and direction. So those uh, institutes covering the third world research has been established. So uh, you can see during that time, the rich ideology is the driving force for China to strengthen relations with Africa. So that's why uh, I think during that time, those cover story, cover page story in our uh, like uh, People's Daily, all those national newspapers, most of them goes to the story to Africa and then shows the people's how strongly support the African liberation movement. And sometimes when the Mobutu things happening in Africa, Congo, Zaire, or whatever, and then you will see even the great demonstration will be organized in our Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square to show this political support uh, to Africa. And uh, nowadays, you couldn't see any uh, big demonstration going on, uh, except for ask for maybe their own livelihood issue. It's not, no more goes to any international affairs. But at that time, that's the story. And then also, we trained those African freedom fighters uh, in China, provide military support to them. So a lot of uh, African, those uh, nation founders, for example, uh, I think, uh, uh, like uh, president of uh, Namibia, uh, and uh, and uh, even even the uh, some Central African countries, the head of the states, they have been uh, trained uh, in China uh, in the year 1970s. So they have becoming so familiar with Mao's little red uh, books, so more familiar <coughs> than some Chinese uh, did. And then an uh, economic uh, front. We have spent a lot of money to support African Tanzania and Zambia to build like Tanzania Rail. That's a typical project uh, because this is the biggest one. But the many other projects have been scattered all over the continent. In uh, Western African countries like Mali, <coughs> those countries that we call it, normally we call it the cotton fall. Those four African countries are rich of those cotton. So many Chinese uh, agricultural projects uh, have been uh, built there and then other countries. So Tanzara uh, was the, the most expensive one. It cost, uh, I think, uh, at least one billion US dollar. At that time, we are not as rich as today. Uh, China now has the world's number one foreign uh, reserves. But at that time, this project, the cost of this project has spent at least one tenth of China's whole foreign exchange reserves. So you can see there's no uh, no economic uh, return for this project. It's purely driven by the uh, political uh, benefits and also driven by the those common desire for fighting uh, for independence. And uh, at the moment, I don't think it's a. Uh, I read some archives. So when I give uh, lectures to my students as well, I don't think this is a purely altruism saying we only fight uh, support African countries to fight. Uh, with their independence. According to Mao's uh, writing, it, and, and also then the Prime Minister, uh, Zhou Enlai, they mentioned very clear, saying if the fighting in Africa, uh, like with those former colonial and formal, uh, those uh, imperialism, which means, and then they can attract uh, some pressures away uh, from those colonialism, imperialism, otherwise they are all build up their pressure on China. So this, they can divert yeah, some pressure away uh, coming to China. So that's the, that's the issue. The, the recent, uh, our recent president visit to Tanzania, to, to Tanzania, they also paid a visit to that brief. We lost uh, 65 uh, engineers' life for building this uh, Tanzania railway. And then in return, uh, what kind of thing we got back? That's the uh, China. I mean the People's Republic of China, and then got the UN seat. 
Uh, before that was Taiwan uh, Authority uh, is sitting there. And then this, I got, also got some picture here. You can see this is a very famous picture. Uh, I have seen this from the historical textbook when I was very little in the, in the middle school, even the junior high school. So Mao has been surrounded uh, with all those uh, young faces from uh, Asia, Latin America, and Africa in the year 1959. So that's a, uh, that's a very famous picture. And then this picture shows this Tanzala Railway, how this railway has been built. So that's the biggest Chinese aid project. Uh, has been uh, spent at least the seven and a half year to finish. So the condition uh, is extremely tough. So that's why uh, World Bank and the Soviet Union, all of those big country and international uh, financial institutions has been turned down the request uh, raised by both Tanzania and Zambia. I also visited a Chinese expertise cemetery uh, based in uh, Dar es Salaam, the suburb of the city. So very few people know the location. So when I ask around the taxi driver to take me there, he has no idea where it is. <laughs> so which means the public diplomacy is very important. So journalists should write something on the paper, and then the local people will understand. Uh, that's a, uh, and then the second, the second period, I think it covered the whole decade of 1980s. So the biggest background is China itself has changed. So after, uh, since the end of 1970s, now you, we all know China has adopted the reform and opening policy. So the gun of four uh, has been uh, cut down. Uh, we have a gun of four uh, during the Cultural Revolution. So Chinese history will, will be also very tough during the, the past times. 10 years, that was in the nightmare, 10 years. So university has been completely closed. And uh, at that time, we, have, we were facing the shortage of the economy. And uh, I had no, I was born at that time. So I couldn't remember, I had, I had ever had a chance to wear new clothes. So my old sister passed his, her clothes to me and I will pass it to others. So that's the issue. And then uh, after the 1978, so now the great leader then, Xiaoping, now assumed the power. So he changed uh, all those ideas the way to look about the international relation and the way to look about how China will develop itself. So for development itself, so no longer talking about so-called class struggle, the people fighting with people, now focus on economic development. Internationally, his worldview is the so-called third world war will not be taking place. So you don't need to spend all your money just uh, trying to dig in the, the, the holes on the ground. That was the thing the Mao has done. So uh, you should spend the money to economic development. And then there is a chance to develop very good relation with Western countries. So if you want enemy, you can got enemy. If you want friends, you can also uh, build on the friendship. So this, I think this is the, the fundamental change about leadership's visions and also the change about China itself. So after this change, and then the change goes to Africa, naturally happens. That is to establish economic cooperation rather than those rhetorical words about friendship and fighting against the imperialism or colonialism. So all those 10 years, China-African economic and trade relations has been developed very rapidly. Even though in recent 10 years, we have seen even more uh, borders development, but the economic uh, front, some uh, new ideas actually has been developed at that period. For example, in 1995, uh, uh, at the end of 19, I think 1980s, uh, so some uh, national uh, meetings has been taken place, organized by the Ministry of Commerce to discuss how to push forward uh, those all rounds of economic cooperation. An idea of uh, establishing joint venture company has been, has been uh, developed at that time. So it's not just uh, the recent story. So that story has been already taken place in the year 1980s. 
So uh, that's why uh, I read some stuff written even by Western scholars. They are saying in the whole year of 1980s, Africa, frankly speaking, has been marginalized a little bit. Not a little bit, actually, maybe to a great extent, from China's uh, the general diplomacy. Uh, because during the year, the first period I mentioned, Africa is such a fox for China's uh, diplomacy. But in the year of 1980s, it's no longer the fox. So the fox has been changed to develop a good relation with Western countries. So you can see uh, even the, the, the leader of the Xiaoping paid a visit to uh, United States. So the famous about his picture where that the cowboy hat and has been so uh, uh, you know, welcomed by uh, American guys. So that's the golden time for China's relation with Western countries. So it's not so golden time for China's relation with African countries. Uh, leader Deng Xiaoping has never visited Africa by himself. And then he sent uh, later on the Prime Minister a uh, job. Uh, he uh, becoming done uh, after the Tiananmen Square event, event. So he paid a visit uh, to Africa. So that's the whole story in the year 1980s. It seems that the economic cooperation, economic benefit has been playing the leading role uh, in, in the whole uh, decade. And then coming following the third period. This period, <laughs> I think it leads all the way, I don't want to cut it into four periods. Some, uh, uh, some scholars say maybe since the year 2000, because that was the year China-Africa Cooperation Forum was uh, officially uh, initiated. Some are saying maybe since then we are entering into the fourth period. But I think uh, even though we have seen a new mechanism, but uh, all of those driving forces or thinking behind uh, how to develop China-Africa region are remain the same after uh, the year, uh, the end of the Cold War. So I, I don't think it's necessary to divide it into another period. So this time, uh, we paid attention, attached importance to political economic, I mean, at the same time. So why is that? Because in the year 1980s, the political meaning has been forgotten to some extent. But now it come up again because there are because that Tiananmen uh, Square uh, event. So Tiananmen Square event has ended those honeymoon time between China and uh, some Western countries. So once again, China found itself has been isolated by all those leading powers in the world. So sanctions has been imposed on China and no uh, official visit to China as well. So at that time, only those African heads of states they come over to Beijing to, to pay the, the visit to, to, to China and also offer their support. They understand uh, this uh, human rights issue, uh, purely the internal issue uh, of the country itself. Uh, the country has the right to deal with it, to choose the way they found it suitable for themselves. So after that, so we often use the free saying China-African relation is an all-weather friends relationship. So which means that's the friend you can count on when yourself in a hard condition. So uh, after that, so China now those leaders from uh, Jiang Zemin and then later on to Hu Jintao, they all pay the visit to Africa, the heads of the state, and the, even our foreign ministry also had developed a new habit since 1990, one year after 1989. So the first overseas trip given by our foreign minister always go to Africa. That's becoming a tradition, unwritten a tradition. So, so it's not surprising to see whenever we got a new one, and then the foreign minister will definitely go to uh, Africa for the first, very first New Year overseas trip to show uh, China Africa is always uh, quite important. So, uh, and then another feature for this period is that relations now has been developed in an all-round way. So because uh, political and economic issue, that's a traditional tool, uh, only tool domain. But nowadays, now we're living in the year of the globalization. 
So people to people, relations, academic exchange, and even now we're sending volunteers to Africa and the military ties has been built on as well. And uh, also we have our Congress, Parliament, uh, also a Congress person also go to Africa. And the NGO has been developing also very fast uh, in China. So it's becoming uh, the multi-level, uh, uh, lots of channels. So I will come to that later on. So this is generally that's the three trends. And uh, quickly, current economic uh, cooperation. So trade, you will see improved very rapidly. China is now the biggest trade partner of Africa since 2009. Uh, so surpassed the United States in that year. So that's why the United States is not so happy about uh, the rapid development of China, Africa. Uh, shortly after I back to Beijing uh, in the coming week, I will prepare my next trip to Washington DC to join another new round of trilateral corporate dialogue between states and uh, China and Africa. So those trilateral dialogue also has been pushed forward by, by the side of the United States, has never been put forward by China side, has never been put forward by African side, always been raised by the American side. So they are eager to do this uh, coordination or cooperation. They think they have been left behind. So there are some concerns uh, from them. So trade volume, I have a little, I have a, has been uh, developed very fast. This is the, the big, the figure is uh, 10 billion in the year 2000. But now, last year is over 200 billion. So you can see uh, the speed. Uh, I also got figure about the Brazil African uh, trade volume. So trade volume is uh, only one tenth of uh, China African trade trade volume. Yeah, actually, I think uh, the, the the distance between Brazil and Africa should be shorter uh, than the distance when you're trading the things from Beijing to, to China all the way to Africa. So you just uh, cross this Atlantic. And uh, also strong complementary, uh, that's, that's the so-called new colonialism coming about. Uh, some are concerned because China imported uh, natural resources and then export uh, these uh, manufactured goods. So they label this as the new colonialism. So I think this is quite, quite simple logic. So if this kind of a trade pattern can be leveled as the new colonialism, and then we have a new colonialism with a lot of uh, countries in this world. With Australia, same pattern. You know, with Brazil, same pattern, right? So many countries have done this, uh, this trade with a lot of countries. So uh, I don't think uh, it's, it's, it's need to correct that kind of thing. And then trade partner has been concentrated. Uh, among them, Angola, also a strong uh, trade partner with Brazil. So this is the charter year. You will see the speed uh, right up from the year 2000. So that's why I will naturally go to the second part, that is the forecast and its impact. So from this, you will see the forecast did play a very fundamental role. That's the year 2000. That's the year that mechanism has been built has been uh, established. So this is trade issue. Now I uh, just <coughs> highlight some new trend. This trade structure now has been gradually changed. Uh, why has it changed? Because uh, African countries has been concerning about this trade imbalance. Because they are, most of them, especially those uh, poor resources rich country, they are facing those uh, trade deficit. Uh, so that's why they are saying, oh, this is tsunami coming from Chinese products, uh, now all coming all over to those countries. They are facing this tsunami of those Chinese uh, products. But for those uh, oil-rich African countries, actually we are facing the trade deficit in our side. So how to address uh, this trade imbalance issue? That's a challenge. Now we open our market further to Africa's commodities. Now the commodities can enjoy uh, duty free and quarter free now has been uh, coming up. From the very earlier, it's only goes to one, 100 uh, items, and from those least developed African countries. Now it's up to uh, 400, and then the recently it goes to 95% of all those countries, their uh, commodities. So if you're counting 
those items, the number of those items, it has already surpassed those items United States now offer to African countries according to their AGOA, AGWA. So because the, under the AGWA is only like uh, less than 5,000 uh, items of the African commodities are qualified to enter into the United States market by duty free and cost free. But according to our new uh, agreement, so more than 6,000 items were from Africa. So nowadays in our market, you will see uh, some marble from Egypt, coffee from Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, Uganda, and auto parts from South Africa, and the electronic products from Tunisia, tobacco from Zimbabwe. So many things made in Africa now available in China. So, uh, so we're trying to uh, address this trade uh, imbalance. And uh, now Africa, uh, I think the challenge will be there for a long time, even though we have made effort, because, uh, because this advantage of rich resources in Africa. So resources will remain the leading factor for, for the foreseeable future. So Africa now is the second largest crude oil resources to China. The first one is Middle East. So around 50% of our oil import is from Middle East.